Hi folks, Eric from Hit Subscribe here with you, and this is the first one of these Q&A uh, live streams that I'm doing in uh, 2024, so happy 2024. Uh, hope everybody's had a great holiday season. Uh, by the time this hits YouTube, it'll probably be like February, so this is going to seem like a weird message, but you know, say la vie. Um, anyway, I um, am doing yet another installment in the series that I do of freelancer Q&A, and I actually have one today that's like hot off the presses. Um, I saw a question on in our community on a video I had done come through, and it seemed like a good opportunity to answer this, to just record a video um, since I saw this earlier today. So that question um, is uh, as follows. You talk a lot, meaning me. You, Eric, talk a lot about strategy work where you talk to executives. What other forms of non-labor work which might not involve, or what about other forms of non-labor work which might not involve talking to top management. I have two clients where I'm basically guiding the team of my client. They have existing teams that do machine learning or in one case have just started it and they want someone senior to give them advice, do reviews, or in one case, serve as inspiration for the junior team members. In my case, when I talk to leads, I tell them I offer this service for a fixed monthly retainer or I can also develop the uh, machine learning things that they need. What's your take on this? So. Um, the way that I had summarized this kind of in the title was um, essentially I'm being asked for my take on, I think like, let's call it non-executive project sponsors. And um, I'm using the term project sponsor to mean the main point of contact that you have that you're engaged with. Now it's worth noting that um, not everybody um, that is a check signer is a project sponsor. So there are organizations where, or um, there are situations where somebody in the C-suite might like sign off on the invoices you send them, but you're not actually engaged with that person. You might never even talk to them. So um, you can definitely have a project sponsor that isn't the actual economic buyer. So um, my take on that is, first of all, if you're filling your dance card with these um, types of engagements, then don't let some blowhard on the internet like me tell you otherwise. So um, there is an element of proof is in the pudding here. If you're getting a lot of um, gigs like this, it doesn't really matter um, what anybody else might think about that. So uh, the thing I would say first and foremost is go with what is successful. I can speak to one thing you said in here that concerns me and what some pitfalls or, or challenges might be in going about what you're doing here. And I'll go through a, a lot of this in more detail for the video, but I mean, just first and foremost, it sounds like it's working. So that's good. Um, the, uh, the thing that I'll say here, generally speaking is kind of a um, framework for the discussion, if you will. The reason that I like to be engaged directly with executives is, um, I mean, other than that being uh, good people to have in your Rolodex for networking purposes in your career, but um, the closer you can get to your economic buyer, the better. And what I mean is uh, generally if somebody sits in the C-suite, if they're an executive, that person is going to have authority to spend the company's money. And um, if that person has authority to spend the company's money, that means that they ultimately don't truly need to get buy-in from anybody else to give you money. Um, another way to think about this is in a lot of cases, if you're going to try to do work for an organization, maybe you're engaged with um, like a software architect or a dev manager or something, that person may very well have to go to their boss who then goes to their boss to get approval. Now that approval might come specifically to engage you, or it might come in the form of a budget into which your uh, particular thing falls. So it's not to say that every time you're engaged with a non-executive, there's going to be an explicit request for permission. It's just that um, an executive, or like if you were to go all the way up to the CEO or the owner of the business, um, that person can always just decide unilaterally to engage you, which means that you have the most direct path to a sale. Now, if you do a lot of um, business and you're not dealing with an economic buyer as your project sponsor, then you're probably very used to conversations that you have about a potential engagement that um, go along through a call or two or however you're engaging. And then inevitably you hear that they're going to have to go and get approval from so-and-so, or they're going to have to get so-and-so to sign off, a department, a boss, whoever. Uh, now imagine if you were having a conversation about doing business with somebody and no approvals like that needed to happen, meaning you're on a call with them 
And if they like the cut of your jib sufficiently, they don't need to go and talk to anyone else or do anything. They can just right there on the call say, okay, send me an invoice and let's get started. That's the situation that you would really love to be in. It makes the sales process significantly easier. It removes buying objections from the mix. Um, it can help to remove people that might be blockers in the organization from the mix. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to that. And so for that reason, mainly because of the implications for your sales and engagement process, I recommend that you try as best you can to get um, your buyer or to get your project sponsor to be the economic buyer or as close to that person as you can get. So um, typically this is going to be an executive at larger organizations. You might get somebody at the director level that has this authority. Um, it kind of depends, but you generally want in an ideal world for the person you're trying to engage directly to be able to unilaterally pay your invoices. That's kind of the um, gold standard that I would go after. Not always doable, not always even necessary, which I'll get to in a moment here, but it definitely and unambiguously makes your sales process significantly easier. So um, in terms of this specific situation, I'm referring over here and another monitor to the question. Um, I actually like everything about this proposal. Like this is a perfectly valid way to engage this type of uh, retainer. The only thing that gives me pause here is at the very end to say, I offer this service for a fixed monthly retainer, or I can also develop the ML things that they need. So let me get a little bit into why I'm fine with everything except that last bit. What you're describing up to this point is essentially training or some flavor, some thing related to training. Now, it might be an engagement where you come in and you... Um, you know, do some upfront, like walk them through some material and training explicitly. Or it might be that you are just kind of around to answer questions and do office hours. Uh, either one of those, I'm going to lump under the umbrella of training and kind of everything in between. And with um, training, there is a very uh, firm delineation um, between you and the client. And um, I, I like what you're describing here as essentially a training business. I don't like the part where at the end you say, I have a training business, I have a training line of business that I do, or you know, I'll just shove everyone out of the way and do it for you as an implementation. That's the part that gives me pause. So to understand why or to explain why, let me talk a little bit about training. Training is um, essentially an incredibly productizable service. So if you're going to train people, it's really easy to bound the scope of your work in all sorts of ways. One way when it comes to training is to say, I do you know, three to five day workshops and that's what I do. So you can time bound training. Um, you can also um, responsibility bound training, I'll say. So uh, if you're gonna come in for maybe an open-ended period of time and work with people uh, to upskill them at the client site, you can say, um, okay, I come in and I work with your folks and I answer questions that they have. Um, you know, these are my office hours. I'll respond to emails within this amount of time, but I do not do implementation. All I'm going to really be doing is helping them, mentoring them if you want, um, helping them with their skills, giving them reading material, et cetera. But I don't do anything. I don't do commits to any code base that you have. I do not implement. Um, so training is very easy to draw kind of firm, clear boundaries around. Now, um, that scoping is part of what makes it very productizable as a service. The other thing that makes it uh, very productizable as a service or another thing that makes it uh, such is that it's very easy to um, uh, do flat pricing around. So you can say, you know, I offer a week of training for $15,000 or I offer this, you know, particular um amount of training and availability for this price per month or whatever the case may be. And it sounds like that's what you're doing on a monthly retainer. So um, training, upskilling other people is easy to sell at a fixed rate. It's easy to delineate in terms of scope and responsibility. It's easy for people to wrap their head around what it is that you're doing and why and what the value proposition is. And perhaps most importantly, it's really easy for somebody who is a non-executive project sponsor, like a manager or something, to sell up the org chart. And I say this for two reasons. Number one, um, training is so clearly understood and articulated that in your situation, if you're um, talking to a company that wants to get into machine learning in some capacity, then the first thing an executive is probably going to think is, 
oh, you know, our folks are going to need some training in this. And then you come along and you offer exactly that. So it's easy for the project sponsor to make the case up the org chart for this and to explain it and to have the people above that person understand exactly what's going on. And furthermore, it's also quite likely that there is existing budget for this type of thing. So a dev manager or a director of software engineering or, you know, whoever your, um, your sponsor might be, there's a pretty decent chance that they already have some kind of training to bu budget for the folks in their organization. In that case, your uh, project sponsor actually becomes the economic buyer. So if the, you know, CIO or something gives the, um, the dev manager, let's say a, you know, a hundred thousand dollar a year training budget, and you're going to charge, you know, $20,000 for your services over the course of time, then that person with that hundred thousand dollar budget can unilaterally decide and approve, and you can work directly with them. So training, there's a lot more likely a situation that that sponsor can be your economic buyer, even if they're not an executive. So all around what you're talking about here makes the situation um, or makes the sale a lot easier. It's a lot easier to sell training lower in the org chart. And that's because it's um, so well understood in price, so well differentiated between what you're doing and what the client folks are doing, so well established as a thing that's needed. Um, it's also, you're likely less likely to encounter blockers because if the teams, um, or the members of the team are gonna be recipients of this training, they're upskilling, so there's a lot of good stuff in it for them. All of that is really promising. So to start a training business or a training line of business, I'm all in on that. Like, I think that's a great idea. It's easy to market. It's easy to sell. Uh, by all means, go do that. Now, I had said that the part that gives me pause is the part where you say, or I can do the implementation for you. Now, there's a lot of um, subtle nuance here, if you will, but what this boils down to in my mind is if you say I do training, I upskill people, I'm an expert in this, I'll teach you how to do it, but I'm not going to do it. Um, you're drawing a pretty clear boundary. If you then undercut that and say, um, or yeah, you know, I can also just do it. Now you're removing the scoping around your offering. And so if I'm, um, buying this service from you, uh, it starts to be less clear to me what you do. So if somebody comes to me and they say, I train people in machine learning, then the mental model I have of that person is um, an expert in machine learning and also probably a pedagogical expert, like somebody that knows their way around training, knows how to teach teams to do this. If you throw in the bit that you will also just, you know, go ahead and, and do the machine learning stuff. Now I start to think that, this smells more like a um, a freelancer just kind of taking whatever gigs come along. Sure, I'll teach you to do it. I'll do it myself. You know, I'll write a, some documentation about how to do it. I'll test it. Um, it feels more Swiss Army knife-ish. And then the idea that you have this productized service type business starts to seem less likely. So you seem just by offering implementation and training, you seem to be kind of a jack of all trades and not probably an expert in any particular thing other than maybe the technology. Um, so it m might in the eyes of buyers subconsciously undercut their perception of your expertise. This is one problem. A more salient problem I think is you're talking about two dramatically different offerings. So implementation, if you look at all the things that make training a good productized service, implementation doesn't share a lot of that. So um, training is very easily scoped with clear delineation of responsibilities. Implementation isn't. You're going to go into their team of software engineers and sure, you're going to do the machine learning piece and they're going to do the other pieces. But that's just like if, you know, Susan works on module A of the code base and Dave works on module B, uh, you start to just look like one of their team members. Implementation is also um, typically open-ended, typically custom, typically kind of in the weeds and an ongoing thing. And because of that, because you're going to be working less as an expert teaching the team stuff and more as a staff augmentation working alongside them, you're going to gradually slide down, I guess, the authority scale, let's call it, uh, as you do the labor piece. 
So you're going to start out with this subtle perception that you're kind of a jack of all trades. And then if you're actually brought in to do the implementation sooner or later, you're just going to look like another one of their engineers, you know, with a slightly different resume on a long enough timeline. That's what it will seem like to them. Now, um, all of that is happening alongside the issue that the implementation piece here now has a much murkier um, value proposition up the org chart. So if I'm the CIO and I have a dev manager that comes to me and says, I want to teach or I want to upskill my team in machine learning, you know, this is where we're going. We're going to be implementing some features like this. I know an expert that we can bring in and, and teach machine learning, and then he'll stick around to um, answer questions on a retainer basis and and do reviews and stuff. All of this makes sense to me as a training engagement, and um, I'm pretty happy about that. Uh, and furthermore, I probably don't want to know any more details. Not really. Like, sure, go ahead if you think this is best, dev manager. Now, let's say um, that same dev manager is coming to me and saying, I want to bring in an expert to implement the machine learning stuff. Now I have questions. Well, do we need an expert for that? Can't we just have a trainer teach the team? Can't our team go take some courses on Linda or Pluralsight or something? Uh, should we have maybe a full-time, you know, should we hire a staff engineer that knows machine learning to do this? Suddenly we're talking about HR decisions. We're talking about how to staff the department. I'm going to want to know like what the terms of this engagement are. Are you just going to come in and do machine learning? Uh, you know, where is there a handoff? Are you going to do this work and then teach the team how to do it? Suddenly this training thing, which would have been a clear, easy pitch, maybe fitting into somebody's budget, becomes a whole deal, you know, with a few different members of the org chart, some of which you may not have talked to. So to kind of circle back to the origins of what you're asking here, um, this, uh, if you're going to sell implementation, I would probably in your position want to be much higher up the org chart in dealing with people just because there's so many weeds that you can get lost in as the dev manager runs this up the flagpole. If you're talking about open-ended implementation that probably is going to run into the six figures or, you know, I don't know what the terms we're talking about here are, but you suddenly have something, um, even just selling implementation alone, it's much less clear. It's much harder to sell. Um, it's going to attract a lot more interest because of the custom nature. Uh, you're probably going to be interviewed more than you're going to have a sales pitch for it. All these things that wouldn't be true if you were just doing the training piece. So um, again, to you know, go back to the beginning, if you're selling these things side by side and it's going well, then God bless. I, you know, I could be wrong about this, but I'm just imagining a sales and marketing plan that I have. I would almost have two different websites. One would be for the training and the retainer services. And I think this is an excellent niche and a position to be in given the current, you know, machine learning zeitgeist right now is to say that you specialize in getting software engineering teams ready for the future when it comes to machine learning. You come in, you train, you answer questions, and you have a whole program that you go through with them. I think you could sell a ton of those. And I don't think you would ever need to do implementation or to tack that on. So, um, and again, you know, I, I don't know the terms of the specific engagements here, but if I'm just looking at it kind of like from scratch, uh, sales and marketing plan, I would stay away from the implementation, especially because I, I think if you are just positioning the um, the training and retainer aspect of this, um, that usually if you're doing something like this, even if you're not marketing or um making it readily apparent that you're willing to do implementation, you'll get asked about it. So if you do want implementation gigs, um, there's a decent chance that somebody for whom you're doing training will just ask you later. And then it's not codified into your sales and marketing and kind of threatening your position as an expert or as a trainer or what have you, uh, or as somebody that just specializes in getting teams ready for uh, machine learning, which is maybe how I would put it. So um, that's kind of my broad take there, you know, there's nothing wrong with implementation. And I've even seen people try to um, ping pong back and forth between uh, implementation and consulting by essentially saying, well, you know, I mostly do training and coaching or whatever, but occasionally I sign up for uh, an implementation gig to keep my skills sharp. So you can maybe do something like that. But I got to say, just reading through all of this, I think that the um, the retainer productized service type training gigs that you're getting there, that's, you know, 
that seems really valuable to me, especially right now. And that seems like it would be easy to sell and to market and to start really filling up um, your dance card with. And I would stay away from the implementation ones because implementation is going to be, I think, generally more of a slog to sell and market, especially if you're not engaged with the executives who are going to be the ones that ultimately have to approve that. But the training piece is pretty easy to sell to somebody who can then take to their boss or maybe doesn't even need to. And um, it can also be a foot in the door for eventual implementation where um, you could maybe quietly without selling or marketing it, uh, express a willingness to do it on kind of a case by case basis. Um, and, and incidentally, if you were wanting to do implementation, uh, training or consulting type gigs are really good tip at the spear for that. Like if you had a bigger business that was specializing in this and you had uh, people that would do both implementation and training, um, if you had a larger agency style business like that, a lot of times that initial training will give rise to like um, uh, more business. So uh, that is my take on the matter. I hope that is somewhat helpful. And finally, I'm doing one that's timely. I'm, you know, working my way through my backlog of these. So it's kind of nice to do one that's actually responding to something that somebody just asked. So hopefully that is helpful um, to the question asker and to anybody else uh, out there watching. And I will catch you next time.